The radio defined the swing era of 1920s and 1930s by bringing music, news, and entertainment directly into homes of hundreds of Americans, with its popularity rising as time went on. Although the radio was a wonderful and influential positive step using to communicate swiftly, it had a negative impact on First Amendment rights, the freedom of speech. The radio was a very popular and influential machine in the 1920s and 30s, bringing people together from all over the United States, even in rural farmland, influencing pop culture with more than 600 radio stations to satisfy the public. It didn't just begin in the 1920s, however. An Italian engineer and inventor named Guglielmo Marconi is credited as one of the first people to exemplify and merchandise the very first wireless long-range telegraph and radio transmissions in 1901. He was 22 years old when he came to England after not receiving much encouragement in Italy, and quickly began to notice sponsors and investors and support of his wireless experiments. Although Marconi played a large part in the early creation of the radio, investors Reginald Fresden and William Dubler also contributed to its development. Fresden is credited as the first man to be publicly heard on the radio on Christmas Eve of 1906. He is a Canadian inventor, teacher, and scientist who had done experiments on wireless telegraphy as he worked for the United States Weather Bureau. In later years, he'd grown interest in the concept of transmitting sound waves. Fesden has invented a number of things useful for radio telephony, one of which being the electrolytic detector, which could pick up a continuous flow of radio waves and was the beginning of the principle of superheterodyne reception, which in short makes it easy to tune into radio signals and is a crucial part of commercial broadcasting. Equally as important as William Dubler, an American scientist and inventor with over 300 wireless telephone and telegraph patents used by the United States, French, and Russian governments. He'd even demonstrated the use of radio communication on Seattle's Alaskan Yukapapan Pacific Exposition in 1909. After World War I ended, the radio began to gain publicity in the 1920s. It became a piece of furniture found in most houses with a consistent flow of mainstream news, music, and advertisements that influenced pop culture and the spread of politics. This was called the golden age of radio. The invention of the radio wasn't just responsible for entertainment, however. It has and still continues to save many people's lives with its vast capability in spreading news and information. Anything from a natural disaster or armed conflict, the creation of the radio was a wonderful and impactful invention. However, the universal problem with the radio that we still face today are its restrictions on free speech in the First Amendment. The impact that the radio had on the First Amendment was tremendous. Although the radio allowed people from all over the U.S. to communicate and tell stories, the government prevented a great deal of language, news, and ideas from being portrayed to the general public. The Radio Act of 1912 gave the government the power to regulate what was being presented on the radio, and also gave the Secretary of Commerce the power to hand out licenses to people wishing to broadcast, and what frequencies they should use depending on what they were planning to present. For example, during the end of the 1920s, a religious and right-wing man was silenced when he broadcast his thoughts on the corrupt government officials of Los Angeles. He was then politically manipulated when his broadcasting license was annulled, with the basis that his political claims were not in the public interest. When the Supreme Court proceeded to disregard this case, they implicitly acknowledged that the right to free speech was not protected while broadcasting on the radio. However, at the time, the radio industry thought that it was a great privilege to broadcast and didn't mind that much about the freedom of speech restrictions. When the Radio Act of 1927 was passed, it did a few things to change and regulate how the radio should work. It created the equal time rule, which meant that all political candidates had to have the same amount of time to speak, and it prohibited any obscene or offensive language to be used. But the act also introduced the Federal Radio Commission, or the FRC, which later became the Federal Communications Commission, which was composed of five commissioners chosen by the president to assign specified radio frequencies to broadcasters because of limited airspace, and to deny license applications if needed. In the early 1920s, President Warren G. Harding would be the first president to have their voice publicly transmitted by radio. However, three years later, President Coolidge would be the first president to give a radio-specific address. Nearly half a decade later, in 1929, Herbert Hoover became president. The stock market was climbing to unprecedented levels, and some investors were taking advantage of low interest rates to buy stocks on credit, pushing prices even higher. After President Hoover had finished his term, President Franklin D. Roosevelt was elected. Starting March 1933 and continuing throughout the years of the Great Depression, 
He gave his famous fireside chats, where an average of 60 million people would tune in, and he would do his best to confront the people of the United States. As a listener of the time, it would have sounded something like this. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. My friends, I want to talk for a few minutes with the people of the United States about banking. To talk with the comparatively few who understand the mechanics of banking, but more particularly with the overwhelming majority of you who use banks for the making of deposits and the drawing of checks. I want to tell you what has been done in the last few days and why it was done and what the next steps are going to be. In the 1930s, the popularity of the radio increased. More than 40% of people in U.S. owned radios and only a decade later it doubled to 83%. Radios were made in smaller sizes and became more affordable by using batteries instead of cords. Most families owned one and would enjoy listening to hundreds of ongoing programs, including soap operas such as Ma Perkins. Good old Ma Perkins. Girl's greatest morale booster. Oh. oh, what time is it? Oh, no, Spencer probably won't be here till after six. He's going to take a hot bath, too. Children's programs like Little Orphan Annie. Yes, oh, I say. She's an awful good teacher, too, Joe. You bet she is. And science fiction programs such as the famed Flash Gordon. Failing in an attempt to escape from the land of Titans, when it is invaded by King Torok of the Iron Kingdom, Flash Gordon and Grego are sentenced to death in a pit of molten iron. Sometimes a family would clear out an entire room to cram 50 or more people in to listen. Music and dramas and plays gave Americans a much-needed distraction during the Great Depression. Schedules were planned around their favorite radio programs so they wouldn't be missed. As they listened, usually in the evenings, they were absorbed in the radio like a great book. The setting of one dial brings music. Another, the morning's news bulletin. A housewife turns to shopping hints. Another makes notes of a new recipe. A man gets the day's market trends or latest sports reports. Or a shut-in smiles and relaxes to that morning word of cheer. The use of the radio hasn't changed since its early days in the 1920s. Millions still listen in on their favorite radio programs every day, on their way to work, school, and even in their own homes. Although the radio has brought, and continues to bring, light into people's lives, complication with the First Amendment still appear. However, the radio wasn't the only thing battling First Amendment rights. Television and social media still suffer to this day. By law, the FCC is prohibited from stopping broadcasts from a certain point of view and infringing people's rights to free speech. However, there are several restrictions that TV broadcasters have to follow. One of these restrictions is any obscene or inappropriate content cannot be aired between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. Another restriction is certain broadcast statements that may endanger the United States or its people, threaten our form of government, or our economic system. Some say these statements are un-American and are an abuse of freedom of speech. Although this censorship happens on social media and television, they are still wonderful tools for communication and have impacted the world as we know it, by supplying fast and accurate communication to millions of people.